Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Beautiful Conversations. We are ripping it up this week with the amazing Eric Davis. He's going to be on in just a moment to strut his stuff. First, I want to remind you that <laughs> it's gone. No more music. I want to remind you that tomorrow is the final day in the Create Your Clown Masterpiece series that I've been doing all week. If you've been on the moon and you didn't know about it, it's it's been amazing. We've had these half hour sessions, lightning sessions every single day at nine o'clock Pacific time, looking at different elements of clown creativity, how to get your clown creating material. And we looked at the, you know, gestating new ideas, how to get material and produce material, how to compose and edit, how to rehearse, all these things. And tomorrow we culminate with the final session, which is all about meeting the audience, that moment when the creative process really blows up and explodes and you get into new territories. And it's going to be on Zoom tomorrow. Instead of on YouTube Live, we're going to be all together on Zoom. It's April Fool's Day tomorrow, folks. It's a, it's, we have to be together. We clowns have to be together on April Fool's Day, right? So come along, um, look out for the link on the Facebook group and all those places. And again, there'll be free stuff that I'm giving away as always. Free copies of this book by Hernan Janay, Clown Dramaturgy, and free sessions with me to discuss whatever creative projects you're working on will be given away tomorrow, absolutely for free. So I'm very excited to welcome the amazing Eric Davis. I've known Eric for uh, some years. We have, uh, we have a clown teacher in common. I think that's what connected us originally. We both worked with the amazing Sue Morrison and have shared many amazing experiences uh, with her and other things which we will talk about. Eric is probably best known for the Red Bastard who, if you don't know about the Red Bastard, I don't know where you've been because he's pretty much the most, I would say the sort of the equivalent in the clown world of a household name now. He is very well known. He also had a, a major role in a Cirque du Soleil show a few years ago called Iris. And he's done all kinds of other amazing things, which we're going to talk about very soon. So welcome to the Clownversation stage, Mr. Eric Davis. Hey. Hey, Barnaby. <laughs> Hi. This is incredibly awkward, like <laughs> pretending like we're meeting again for the first time. Yes. <laughs> nice to meet you, Eric. The asked to figure out the cab is not working. What's going on? And like, oh, hey, Barton. <laughs> yeah, we just had a little chaos moment, didn't we, before we came on? Yeah. Like, now I'm confused about which camera to work at because the old camera. So I might do what? Am I, which? This one? Okay. That's it. That was the one. I mean, that's become a thing, though, hasn't it? With Zoom, we're all used to this idea that eye contact. It's kind of like a little bit skewed off because we're used to looking at the screen and then it doesn't look like we're looking at the camera and there's that weird, you know what I mean? <laughs> I just heard, it was like having a streaming issue, but yes, absolutely. I wholeheartedly concur whatever you said and I stand behind <laughs> you 100%. 100%. Well, yeah, I just said you're a big ass and you deserve to be kicked off the stage. So. Okay, I'll go with it. I'll go with it. I didn't actually. I, I just want to say I didn't. I didn't say that. I definitely didn't say that. You're sweetie. <laughs> so how are you, Eric? Because, you know, we weren't, haven't been in touch for a few years until a few weeks ago. And you've just been doing so much. You're such a, a busy person. How is life in the, how has life been in the pandemic and now post pandemic for your clownishness? Is that, is that a, can you give me a, 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 a easier question than how has life been in the pandemic? <laughs> All right, easy question. Oh, great. Next. What do you have for, what do you have for breakfast? Great. <laughs> uh, I'm actually very good. I'm very good. Uh, I'm here in LA at the moment, and uh, there's a, a really thriving uh, clown community here. The clown idiots uh, kind of got their own thing going on in this in this microcosm, which is very fun and exciting, and I'm super happy to be involved in that. And I'm 
working on making new material and I'm working on with other people to help them make new material. So yeah, it's a, it was a horrible time and it's, it feels like, it feels like coming up again out of the ashes of the pandemic. Yeah, Mm. for sure. Mm. Take us back. Um, you know, I always ask this this question to all the guests and because it's always a good story and I don't actually know your story. How was it that you got into clowning in the first place? What was your kind of light bulb moment of, I'm a clown? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I started, this wasn't clowning, but it was the gateway, my gateway drug into clowning that I was in a high school they had these kind of drama tournaments They were called forensics. So some people would be in the debate part, but then I was in a section where there was a particular event called improvised duet acts. And they would, you would would pull something out of a hat and you'd have a certain amount of time to make this sketch, but there wasn't enough time to really complete it. So you would hit these kind of landmark places that you're kind of prepared like I think I want to hit this and then we want to do this and we're going to get there but then you have to kind of improvise your way in between in front of a judge and audience and that's still I think what I do today I don't know if that was just because that's my first introduction into it but I really liked that combination of making things up a little bit on the fly so they were fresh and and raw and uh, kind of visceral and intuitive, but mm-hmm. also you had these prepared things you were trying to get there. So there was some sort of arc to it. Um, and then, so I got into drama that way. I really enjoyed that. And I went to university where they had a Lecoq teacher and they, the Lecoq teacher asked at the end, uh, at the beginning of one of the semesters, is there anything uh, genre that you guys want to, you know, try out that we haven't done yet? And one of the students said, what about clown? And the teacher stopped and he was like, well, the thing about clown is, is that if the audience, if the audience doesn't like you, they don't like you. And that's all he said about it. And we never did it. So <laughs> it was like, what, what is that thing? What's yeah. that thing, clown? So then I, I hired, uh, I was with a company and we hired a guy, David Gaines, to give us a workshop in clown. And we made a show based on that around Franken, Frankenstein which I don't think was a clown show. I remember at the time thinking there was a question mm-hmm. and we were like, do you think we should look at the audience when we do this? It was after the workshop. You know, so our, our, the, the mentor was gone. It was just us with ourselves. And I, and I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think we should look at the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is not what I'm all about, like this connection with the audience. But I remember it was so funny to look back and think like, mm, I don't think that's a good idea. Mm-mm. Um, so yeah, from there, we, uh, we actually, we were influenced by Bob Berkey, my, uh, my colleague, Alex Kipp went to go work with Bob Berkey and he brought back some exercises, which were amazing, really Mm. changed the way we understood what we were doing. Mm. Uh, and then I think from there, I worked a little bit with Goyer right when I moved to New York. And then we also, uh, met Sue Morrison in New York as well. Mm, okay so that was that was your entry into into sue's work and you, did you sort of pretty quickly go and do the full mask workshop with her after that um what was the order of things it's been a, it's been a while now but like yeah i did yeah, yeah I, I i went to go i went to go do the mask workshop at some point i can't remember if we'd worked on something else first but yeah maybe it's pretty probably pretty on pretty early on i what? think that we were going to make a red bastard show and then we ended up making a clown show instead right so we did the workshop with her and then like later on we went to go work on uh uh to, to create a show together yeah yeah absence of magic that's right yeah which is an amazing show uh, I, yeah i haven't done that for i don't know, I don't know if it still is anymore because i haven't done it for so long but uh well i'm glad that you like that that's good yeah it's beautiful you know there's a picture that somebody sent me a while ago from their archives of a page in the New York Times with you and me. Uh, uh, and it's a big full full spread with a big picture of you in Absence of Magic and a big picture of me with my birdcage, kind of like- Oh, was it for the I, festival? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. It's such a cool image. I should send it to you. I have oh, please, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Oh, very yeah. cool. 
Um, so, so <clears throat> interesting. So the Red Bastard came before that. I mean, the, <clears throat> not necessarily the show, but the character. You were sort of developing the, the Red Bastard character. Oh, I'm, I'm now. I, I have to I have to like replace my mind for all this stuff. We did. Now I remember. Before I did the clown workshop with her, we hired Sue to give us a Buffon workshop. Right. I haven't. I haven't thought back to that to that time for a while. Uh, so, yes, yeah, she gave us. A, she gave us a Buffon workshop, and at the time, uh, it was uh, the war was happening, and there was some quote up in Canada about those bastard Americans. And so they called this Buffon show that we made, I think it was five of us, we made this thing called the the Bastard American Show. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And then, and so the Red Bastard kind of, was that the character that you played in that show, sort of, or a version of that character? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Started from that. Wow. So I didn't, I didn't know that. So it was, you were in the context of an ensemble show before you did any solo for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, the show was fun, but it just like, you know, like, it's hard to keep shows up and going. Uh, but there was something yeah. it was just the beginning for me. So I was like, there's something here that I feel like people like. So, you know, in New York, I could just keep doing it. At, there were all these variety shows. So I was like, well, I'll just take this like, it was like seven minutes uh, from this show. I think these seven minutes and start to, to do them at different variety shows and cabarets and stuff. And then I write some more stuff and eventually it was 20 minutes. And then a guy was like, Hey, can you do 45 minutes uh, at this solo festival? I said, okay, great. And then I get there and I realize, Oh, this solo festival is in a bar with a pool table between it while the televisions or sports, sports shows are going on. You know, and my, my friends came to see it. And I'm just like, I'm out the pool, on the pool table. Like, nah. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> but it made me make, a larger amount. So I could say, I've got this show, even though like that stuff, yeah, that's junk and none of that stuff lasted. But, you know, I built up the show little by little by little mm. over a long time. Really, so really I interesting. I found what it was. Yeah. It took me a while to figure out like, what's the theme. Because that's kind of the very different way of working, right? I mean, I'm, I assume Absence of Magic and your clown show was made similarly to my clown show, which is that you can't, I mean, it does develop over time, but once, once you, you you go through that long process, you create a show and the show, that's the show. It has a script. And and it sounds like The Red Bastard was a totally different kind of process. It was much more of this kind of like, uh, as you said, kind of starting with a small little nugget that you performed and then it slowly grew and kind of almost like The Red Bastard itself. <laughs> it's kind of like strangely misshapen and changing its form and kind of a little bit grotesque. Yeah, I mean, I guess it was just like a reflection of whatever anxieties I was having at the moment and try or, you know, maybe found funny or or was exploring uh, in terms of Buffon. Like maybe I was like wanted just to for like at the beginning, I was I was just like, I want to be visually interesting in the space. And can I move my body in a way that I feel like keeps the audience engaged? And then sometimes I was like, hmm, I wonder, like. Like, what could I do that was feeling kind of like edgy? And so I was exploring mm -hmm. those spaces. And then eventually, like, I was kind of like, oh, I need to get more. Like, what's this about? Like, you, sometimes there were, it was about things that I didn't quite understand mm -hmm. yet. Uh, but then other times I was like, well, okay, it's about this. But then, like, does the audience care about that? So it's like, how do I make it universal? And just kind of like, well, over time, eventually, I found something where I was like, okay, this is, I was lucky to have done it in such a hot haphazard way, really, that eventually like everything kind of clicked together. That even mm. if it was abstract and kind of a juxtaposition, people could look back and say, well, this actually sets up this and this sets up this and gives this gives us an emotional feeling here that opens this up and then like, oh, so that we're here. And then, you know, there can be this explosion at the end of the show of, uh, of, of experience to the audience, you know, potentially. I mean, it is an amazing experience, you know, that I've maybe seen you do it three or four times. And, um, you know, it's different every time. But there is this kind of um, edginess to it. And it's electrifying, you know, when you're sort of in the presence of this character, it's like uh, more than anything I've seen before, maybe a transform, you know, transformational feeling that you're kind of embodying something that is really other, otherworldly and um, is quite scary and makes you feel... <laughs> 
edge on the edge of your seat sort of all the time. <laughs> There is kind of that mask work stuff involved in it. I mean, yeah. not involved in it, but like uh, uh, the psychology of it sometimes. Like, uh, I mean, I there are certain, you know, there are certain ways that, that I think as a performer when I'm playing that character where some of them are like, I just want to be fun or I want to be charming or I'm like, I'm like I've got this appetite uh, or I want to... Uh, confront or I want to fuck with you or I want to be mischievous uh, you know in all of these different ways and um, like so sometimes even like when there was once where there's a where there's a child <laughs> like I had to be like whoa like there's the, there's you and then there's the the mask the, per, the persona of mm. this kind of like demon character and you know you have to have a leash on, you know as the performer right. the artist yeah. has a leash on that right it's yeah. there to serve your agenda but it has its own agenda really yeah yeah so you have to say ah, but my okay. agenda is is yeah. primary so there was a once with a, there was a moment with a kid and like the persona was like do you want to know everything there is to know about the world tonight and this kid was like <laughs> no they, you didn't know what I was talking about. Mm. And and the audience was like, <gasps> mm. and, you know, I was like, oh, I'm entering into the world of its agenda, which is like, you know, I don't know what that, in my mind, it's like, it opens up, it's Red Bastard opened up its chest and it's the universe and you have like white mm. hair after mm. you say, look what there is to know about the world. And yeah, we don't want to know mm. what there is about the world. And this kid, and I was like, fine you know and i had, and i made sure that this kid was okay coming out mm. of that and i was like, mm. I was like that's really interesting yeah, yeah. but i want um, to give a visceral, a visceral uh experience to the audience and, and to myself as well yeah you do you do um i just want to come to some comments um and folks wh who, are, who are watching um please uh, get get busy in the comments and um say hi be great to know who's out there, where you are, and who has seen Eric performing. Um, let us know if you've seen Eric as in the Red Bastard or anything else. It'd be great to know, and where you saw him. It'd be fun to kind of re uh, revisit those moments. You know where and when you saw him. Um, David, he has a comment. Um, Eric, it seems you created a new and brilliant show for us healthcare clowns in Lisbon at that conference. What would have been your time frame for creating that? Oh, um, uh, hey, hey, David, how are you? Um, I was asked uh, to make some special material for uh, a clown care conference that happened in Lisbon. And um, so the, uh, 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 the, two, the two directors of the, of the conference, um, spoke to me over Skype and they were telling me all, cause I'm not really from the, from that world. It was really interesting to hear them talk about, well, here's the complaints here, the, here's the issues that come up around all that stuff. And so I was like, well, I'll just make material around this. And then I kind of inserted it into the other show that I had already prepared. And I remember, but it's like, you, you know, you make new material and you're kind of just barely holding on to it. There's all this yeah. thing. It's like, should I even do it tonight? If you have something that's already prepared, you're like, maybe I should just do the prepared stuff and not do the new yeah. stuff. I don't know if it's ready. Yeah. But I went ahead and I did it, and it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I'm just kind of David. I was kind of just uh, integrating both of those things together. But to be, I don't know how much time it took. To be honest, it's like a Swiss cheese factory in here, <laughs> a, a Vonnegut novel or something. Like I have the images, but you know how it's put together. It gets a little. I'm not like it was August seventeenth, nineteen forty five. <laughs> and it was raining and no no it's not like that you didn't keep a daily journal it of your uh... drag the trash drag yeah the trash. well that's really interesting though because i i often feel when i'm when i'm clowning particularly when i'm invited to perform at a certain because i used to be really in in uh academia you know so i was doing a lot of performances at conferences and and so i used to in the same way that academics create papers just a one-off paper for a, for a conference that's about a particular topic. I would make a clown piece that was just a one-off for a particular conference, and of yeah. course, it would be 
it would be great in a com in the context of an academic conference because mm -hmm. people are so ready for anything that's kind of different and funny and performative when they're all standing up and reading these boring things i shouldn't say that but you know um but i always felt like oh my god i'm putting so much effort into a performance which is one time only because it's so specific to this conference and this context kind of you never really do it again but it's so precious you know that thing of this one off it's it's one one time and you, and and it's just made for that moment and uh, it doesn't seem very efficient but yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting point too like when you're making material trying to figure out like is it going to be you know i guess like what's your agenda is it you know are you you're expressing something like you know we are reflecting the world around us and are you making this piece to reflect it for just this moment because you're processing something for yourself and the audience at that mm -hmm. one point, like I remember, I remember a show after there was this after 9/11. We were in we were in New York, and there was a scare about the dirty bombs. And Alex Kipp and I, who was in this uh, John Brown Theater Company with me, a really fun uh, clown and, and clown teacher. Uh, he's the guy who brought Bob Berkey's stuff to us. We made this show where we locked ourselves in this small theater, and we're preparing to be in this theater until the dirty bomb you know, radiation went away That's and cool. we just did it one time, but it was so fun. Yeah. And then there's other times like you're making stuff and you're like, you know, I want to be, I want to be able to do this for a yeah. while. So yeah. is it universal? Is it going to be over in six months? And I really try to keep things the the heart of the thing, you know, universal that will be sticking around and, you know, you can pepper in the little things, but it's, I don't like it if I got something that's going to be, that's really integral. That's got to be gone then. And yeah. Wild. Did you make any work about the pandemic during while it was happening during those two years? Uh, I was working on making a, a short animated film. Uh, I thought I was. I mean, I storyboarded it and everything. Uh, and, but I, we were talking before we got here about just all the technical aspects and learning all of those things this summer. So, you know, I thought I was going to make this little thing on my iPad. From this program which was junk and then it got me into the adobe suite so then i had to start learning like adobe premiere but you have to like oh, it's adobe animate but you actually yeah. got to know after effects so you actually got to know this so it was like four or five adobe programs in rabbit hole oh god so and then i was like oh wait i don't know how to you know compose things it was like i have to do more about that and then i had a, an injury so i stepped away from going mm -hmm. like this all day you know yeah it's not good did you were you performing um online at all have you have you stepped into that world of pr presenting a piece for the for the zoom or the camera not really um but you've been teaching online i've been teaching online yeah that's been a yeah, lot of fun. how's that been super fun yeah yeah a lot of beautiful things happening in there and, and very playful i mean it's not you know there's certain things you can't do there's like the spatial elements and so you can't have that three-dimensional uh, elements sometimes the rhythm you know, the rhythm is is different so mm. you know, there's a lot of things that things look like things are starting up so i think i'm gonna do my first uh in-person you know workshop in la here uh in a couple weeks so yeah oh so, very cool well tell people where and when so in case they happen to be local okay yeah well there's a couple of things i have a i have an online workshop again if, you, if you've never done anything with buffon that'll be happening this weekend um, starts on Saturday and then on, in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, I think the 16th and 17th of, uh, of April, I'll be doing, um, uh, an in-person workshop at Mimoda. And both of those, if you go to redbastard.com slash Buffon, or if you go on mm -hmm. there, there'll be a tab on that says Buffon. We'll find information about that. Very cool. Maybe yeah. somebody who's listening can put, find that link and put it into the comments while we're yeah. talking um so there's some cool questions here let's see uh jen jen i don't know which jen you are jen uh could you tell us some more about your failures Not <laughs> just in, ge in general more <laughs> more failure yeah you can talk about the camera this morning what kind of failure if you're still there tell me what kind of failures you want to know about because i got a lot of them and it's kind of broad <laughs> it's, big... it's kind of broad territory but uh, failures 
I mean, uh, goodness, that is a, that is a big question because where do you even start with that when you're you're well? Coach? It's like you mean my opportunities for learning, <laughs> my opportunities for learning. Um, huh. Well, if I just let my mind roll a little bit here, like what? I don't know. What do you what do you want to you want to provoke me a little bit with that uh, in a in a in a good way, Barnaby? Like what's like, yeah. Like, like um we enter into that well we could talk about flops like when have you put some material out there into the world and it's just tanked i mean sometimes going to different <laughs> i remember going to perth and doing the red bastard show the original one and and just i was very excited I was like i always think of like the Australians is being like, ah, like really, yeah, we're gonna go. Cause I was presented that way in the movies when I was younger. <laughs> and and I love Australians. And but when I went to Perth, like they did not want that show. It was wow. It was interesting that I had to pull back so much that mm. nobody wanted to talk to me. And I yeah, it. It was very interesting. I had to almost turn it into like a children's show. Like I had to pull back that much into it. It was very, very surprising. I didn't expect it in Australia to. It was specifically in Perth because it wasn't like that necessarily in Adelaide or or Melbourne. So that's kind of interesting sometimes when you're just like, ooh, I got to like completely like redo my tactics for things. And, and was then, that in the moment that you had to make that decision actually at, on the stage? Like, oh, this isn't working. I need to rethink oh, it. Yeah. it. Oh, yeah. It was like, woof, this crowd. I mean, and, and recently I did a show that was, I mean, after that, I did, but it was a great learning experience to say, like, okay, like it was one of the first times where they were like, they were like we don't even want to answer you. Mm. Uh, and I had never experienced that before. So I was like, okay, is something going on here? And I think when I was younger, here's something that's kind of interesting, maybe Jen, is that like I used to, sometimes when I was younger, you know, I could my anger sometimes was a fuel for play, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was kind of curious about kind of exploring those lines, sometimes like I could be like, oh, I might if I ever got truly angry at an audience. That never went well. It never went well. Somebody might have enjoyed it, but it was like I never came away from that experience feeling like this was good. I remember one time I got into like this, this, this sounds like a stand-up story in a way, but it's like I was at a festival and there was somebody that just was so drunk, like not in their right mind, but also was not being taken out. And I, I remember in Adelaide particular, I was like, oh, I have to learn a bunch of, what do you call it? Like heckler responses. I had my own, yeah. but I was like, it was so intense because yeah. there was so much drinking going on there. And I wasn't used to being in those environments yeah. that I was like, I'm gonna have 20. I found a research paper that was, that was studying them. So like, these are typical types of it. And I was like, okay, I'm making it my own. I'm making it my own, making it my own. What's my angle on it? So that I had like, you know, 25 of these things ready to bam, 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 I, I don't know. I think um I'll bleep it. I'll bleep myself. Some, sometimes I think that the um the, the the crazy YouTube bots can pick it up and then it and then they okay. yeah I won't curse it. So there's yeah. a there's like a peaches song called F the Pain Away. F the Pain Away. There's a very funny uh uh think video that somebody did where they put these Muppets to it. <laughs> like a Muppets F the Pain Away by Peaches. <laughs> a great video. <laughs> like I want to see that. Oh, it's Miss Piggy and Kermit and and you know, it's great. So I had that song and I was just, I just started singing like, drink the pain away. I think I was being a pig, being like, uh -huh. eh. and then like being like, drink the pain away. And I think I just, I just made oinking sounds and said, drink the pain away for like six minutes on stage. <laughs> this lady. And it didn't really, you know, it expressed it. And there was some truth in that. There was like, oh, this mm -hmm. lady is like, 
unable to do that. But also I was like, I was kind of, I was ugly too. Mm -hmm. And like I was playing, but I don't know how great of a moment that was in the show. So I'd call that in a way a failure, but also like, it was good that I went through it because I learned about that. And then I remember afterwards there was, we spoke, the lady and I spoke and I was like, I don't think we need to apologize to each other. I think that that happened and we both had our parts in this meeting and let's mm -hmm. just take that and go away and we'll think about it for the future. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I meant it. Like, you, I mean, I think that you should think about that space for you and I'm going to think about that space for me and let's not say that it's all okay. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think that in some way that that, that space, that confrontation is kind of what, sometimes is valuable about Buffon. It's like, you got to try to find the right lane of it. So it's not like, mm. you know, you don't want it to be anything to be damaging or, or traumatizing, but confrontation yeah. can be an aspect of it. It doesn't have to be confrontational, but. In it's, it's for you is, um, is Buffon a subset, kind of a subgenre of clowning or are they completely separate? You know, check in with me every five years and I'll probably have a different nuanced take on it. But yeah. in a way, like, you almost hate to put like these lines between things yeah. so that you do, people don't get, so people don't get restricted or codified. But if mm -hmm. we could talk about it, the way I, I think about it now is if, if you don't think about it as a style, uh, I mean, yeah, okay, they can be styles and genres, but if you don't think about it that way, and maybe you just think about I'm working in, in different ways sometimes, mm. and that you can have clowning in a Buffon show, and you can have Buffon kind of stuff in a clowning show, but maybe it's about, you know, if I'm allowing people to laugh at my ridiculousness, then that's probably what most people contemporarily think about the clown in the Western world. And mm. if I'm if I'm working in a way where I'm laughing at your ridiculousness or the ridiculous of, of somebody else, or even in a way I could target it towards my, my own, I could be mocking myself, but projecting it onto you. That's like another mm -hmm. way. But, but it's like, basically, are you allowing people to laugh at your vulnerability or are you the person who's mm -hmm. like mocking and playing to laugh at something else? Mm -hmm. you know, I'm stupid. You're stupid. Which I'm could stupid. be. Stupid. <laughs> Which could be very high status clown, right? I mean, like the Joey kind of, you know, high status clown who could never imagine that there's anything wrong with him or her, and um, oh sure, uh, is therefore able to mock other people with impunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think these things like there's so much crossover, and like I think the the really important question is like, where do you enjoy to play? Right. You know, where do you enjoy yeah. to play? And then also, you know, where does the audience enjoy you? Mm. Uh, and also maybe like, what's your agenda? Like, you are, are you a person who's like, I just want to have fun and, and, and to, to laugh and to make other people laugh? Are you a person who's like, I got something to show people? Like, mm. you could do that in Clown or Buffon too, but I guess it's more about the way. Yeah. There were so, some, I thought, in your, in Red Bastard shows, some very vulnerable moments. I mean, there were some mm -hmm. moments where you like, get truthful and get you take risks uh, it's necessary i when i when i used to i used to like that's why i say i check in every five years uh i remember at some point when i was younger i would sort of say things and trying to figure out what it is and you want something strong to hold on to um but i would say like oh buffons don't show any vulnerability and i don't i wouldn't say that now now i would say uh i'd probably just say the thing i already said but even just to show your, I think whenever you show your pleasure, you have to be vulnerable to do that in a way. Right. Like whenever you see somebody's pleasure, like you have to open it up to, to let it out and for people to see it in some way. But also it's like, you can't, you just can't have too much of the same thing in a show. So it's good to have vulnerable and clown moments. Even if, you, even if later on you're, you were just like, I was just fucking kidding, you know? But just for the experience to have it be dynamic and, and changes, you want that. So I think you really want clown and a Buffon show and maybe something that gets a little bit sometimes like not precious and something wild, you know, in your, in mm. your clown shows as well. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. And I, I love that insight about pleasure being 
exposing your pleasure being being vulnerable you know mm. that's really interesting and it is it's it's about at the end of the day like it's about human experience right and we are we we all have that p potential within us to that the booth you know the 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 putting up of the barriers that the booth on t kind of does like it's it's all about you now it's not about me it's all about you projecting you know that kind of ability to say i was kidding before that's very it's such a human thing right we all do that and we see that all the time where people kind of disown uh some moment of vulnerability that they've just had or something that they've just opened up but then we know yeah. somehow that that it's just a mask and that in the next moment they could be totally soft and vulnerable and opening up again. Yeah. There's a question there, it's a thought. Yeah. I was I was trying to I was trying to recently to try to give like it's like, what is it that I'm coming out of the pandemic? Because like it was like, ugh. It's like, what am I doing? Like, what do I, what makes me happy? What am I interested in my work? I was trying to like put like a, at least for today. Uh, um, I mean, for this moment in my life, like a, uh, I read this book uh, after I was you know, flummoxed by, you know, trying to make this animated thing and being like, I don't know, composition. So I got this book about composition and it was saying, you have to define your problem. It's one of the first things it says, like in order to create something, you have to know what you have to So, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Mm. And I thought, oh, that's so like evident, but really uh, profound. So I was like, well, what am I trying to do with my own work? And I kind of came up with this for the moment, something like this, if I can even remember it, um, that uh, I like, I want to make, uh, I want to meet the audience. So regardless of like genre or clown or Buffon or whatever, like it's like, I want to, I want to meet the audience uh, in this playground um, where uh, I am sometimes guiding them and they are sometimes guiding me through a dynamic journey of fun, vitality, and meaning. And if I can get that done in the show, I think that's where I want to be. And then it, it's funny. It's the strange thing is it doesn't say funny in there, even though I think that's just part of the fun or whatever, mm -hmm. but like, that's what I hope to have happen in my, uh, in the, sh in the shows. Mm. Um, and is that a question? Like, is that the problem? What's what's the problem within that though? How do you make it? Right. <laughs> you know, there's sub there's sub there's sub problems. You know, meaning about like what what's the what's my agenda as the artist? Then you know, there's other things that come into those. What's my agenda as, as the artist? What am I here to to have happen? Uh, what's the what's the persona? That that is that's going to be good for me to take, you know. If if I'm taking them on this tour of this dynamic journey or whatever, then I'm kind of like a tour guide, mm. potentially. So I'm going to meet you. And it's like presenting, you know, thing of like presenting yourself uh, from from Pachinko. Like present yourself, take me into your world, transform me, and bring me back with a new awareness. Then who is who is the persona that's not Eric, mm. or is it Eric? You know, is it Eric? Do I just need to be myself in this? Um, I'm working on a show now where I just, I just want to be mean. And my, mm. my prompt is just to be uh, my best, you know, the best Eric. Mm. Uh, not necessarily the nicest, just the most Eric I can possibly be, you know, as I take through and then the themes will find themselves, um, I hope. But So as you think about this problem then of, particularly the first part you mentioned of sometimes I'm leading, sometimes the audience is leading, right? This kind of dance, uh, co-creation. I'm, I'm curious, like what are the solutions that you've come up with that, or, or ideas you've come up with for sort of how to do that, how to be in that dance with the audience? Well, I mean, I guess I just, there's, there's a, I guess different ways that it sort of, rings that's that you can kind of enter into that i mean one is that you could just go into a space and be like i have no agenda other than just have a have a uh to be in a state of play or conversation with you guys and i'm you're i'm gonna do something and i'll see how you react and if you react, mm -hmm. you know, maybe i'll even ask you questions or give you the opportunities to do things and i'll react to that we just go back and forth 
Mm. So in that sense, improvisation. As long as you're, you know, which is different than it's like, I don't think we should look at the audience. You know, like where, yeah. I, you know, in that show, I was like, I'm doing this, and then I do this, and then I do this, and you're going to see me do all these things. So, mm. I mean, just when you basically start to play with the audience, that's, it is its own thing of like that back and forth. I mean, sometimes then you might have, so I've got this agenda. I want to do this and I want to end up when I want to appear. Uh, but I always would say a little prayer to myself before the show where I ask for something unexpected to happen mm -hmm. uh, in the first five minutes so that I would have to follow that. And because I knew it would put me in a, you know, I hadn't made that, I hadn't made that, you know, that problem for myself yet that I want to be, but I instinctually was, was knowing like I'm better when I'm sometimes following the moment rather than just executing. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not as alive. I think the show isn't as alive. Like if I just did the show and it, they all laughed and it went very well, I'm like, yeah, it was funny and it was a good show and they liked it. I don't know if it was a great show mm. because I, I need, and for my problem, I want that vitality. Uh, and there's something about their, I mean, it's not stated, I guess, but I like that unexpected something about that quality of that there, that, that conversation. So sometimes like sometimes things might, I might just, I got my script. My show is highly, highly structured, highly structured. It's got mm. a lot of years of scripts on it, a script on it. But it, you know, I, with that prayer in mind, I think like if something happens, I could leave it. So my show could be 45 minutes or it could be an hour 45. Mm. An hour 45 is too long. Mm. <laughs> I was too indulgent if I did that, but. And then sometimes I specifically make structures where I guess I've developed in, in the past two shows, something almost like a dialectic. I remember being in university and seeing these conversations between Socrates and a, you know, a student or something like that, where this kind of, this kind of thing, well, what I'm saying, I'm trying to keep it playful and, and keeping play and game and stuff around and say, okay, well, so this is, so is, so this is, or, or, or what, what do you think about this? Oh, that's what you think about it. Okay. Well then if that's what you think about it, then so then, so then mm -hmm. this or this, it's this. Okay. But really there's, <laughs> the, the audience may not realize, but there's like, there's a map and I've really thought it through mm -hmm. and I know through experience that we're probably going to end up over here. And a lot of times there are these things where it's like, um, how do I say this? You're probably going to say this. 85% of the people say this. If they don't mm -hmm. say that, they probably say this. So then if I want to go here, then I take that in, I accept what you say, and I play with it. And I'll go with what you said, or I'll go with the other thing, or I'll say, what's everybody think? And there's a lot of ways to get that excavate ideas and content mm -hmm. from the audience. Um, yeah, sort of like those um, choose your own adventure books where you you, yeah. you know all the um, you know all the avenues because you've done it so many times you've taken all the avenues yourself. You and the third one is like something they will fucking throw a curveball at me I've never thought of. Yeah, um, the beautiful thing in the last show where we were exploring the rules of love and somebody at some point said they jumped up and she's like, but you're talking about sex. Like I'm talking about love. And I was like, Oh, okay. Okay. Like I was talking about, but, but she had, was, you know, identifying more into that place. It was a great thing to like, okay, let's open that up. And I put something that was so important in the show where it's like, Oh, there was a space where people are way more terrified about issues of love that don't involve uh you know sex <laughs> so like, like oh who's watching this is that okay but so it was, it was opened up this really interesting powerful part of the show that i didn't uh i i didn't know about yet in that specific right. avenue to create a little game around this thing yeah. with, that really freaked people out like just about like going to go watch netflix with somebody like thinking about like partners and what are the rules of love and like going to watch Netflix with somebody who wasn't your partner and people got freaked out way more about that idea <laughs> than the, than 
you know, about things that were involving sex. I was like, oh, that's so fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. You know. So, so when you, when you open like, up something like that, them. when you open up a new thing like that, make a discovery about the show, does that end up being part of the show after that? You sort of integrate that? If it's good, I try to. I mean, I, I, I guess I try to figure out, like, like you were saying, is it, was it of the moment? Is it mm -hmm. something that will always belong to that show? Or is it, so do I try to construct it so I can mm -hmm. set it up to make it happen again? Or is it something where it's like, I have this in my mind, this happens sometimes, I'm ready to go mm -hmm. with it again if it comes up. Mm -hmm. um, or do I let it go? And that's a beautiful I suppose moment. this is, you know, what you're talking about reminds me, makes me think about, um, traditional circus and well, all circus, I guess, where, where, you know, audience participation and volunteers, people coming up from the audience is kind of like a standard thing and has become, I think, more, more increasingly the case. And I think one of the reasons that they do that is because it always introduces this element in the audience's mind of unpredictability and and for the performer as well, right? I mean, unless they're a plant, which is a, is a different thing. Mm -hmm. But if you're bringing a real audience member out, uh, maybe inter interacting with them out in the audience or you're bringing them up onto stage to do something, there's always this like frisson of, of well, they could just kind of do anything up there and the performer has to follow them and go with them. And those moments, it, it's, it's almost like um, manufactured uh tension and anticipation it's just you don't have to even when I, mean, I found this with my show there was a whole segment where i brought somebody up from the audience and it was nearly always i felt like the best part of the show because you could it just becomes, see the audience it, were enjoying it so much it becomes it's it's like a structure to make to create pure clown in a way yeah yeah because like the uh, the the reactions you know are fresh uh, in in that moment and the surprises and the accidents like it's it's like it makes that you know you're in pure clown state or you're or you're or you're recreating states which were pure but are very much a part of your makeup so that you can you can feel them a lot again or you're in the territory of of farce or something where it's like you have to hit this beat and that's what it is and it may not even necessarily originally yeah. been about you at all um, but they're all kind of, you know, places where you're dealing with idiots. I mean, if you're talking about kind of clown stuff, but yeah, I think it's a nice, it's a nice way to get into that pure clown state. Did you, um, when you were working at Cirque doing that show, was there, um, I'm, I'm curious about that whole experience. I mean, did you learn stuff? Was it, was it a difficult experience? Was it, what was good about it? Oh, every Cirque show has been an amazing experience and a difficult experience for sure. Yeah everyone uh i've had you know lovely super fun times and, and difficult times so mm. um yeah like i guess for for iris that was what, what was the question about it like what were you yeah i suppose i mean uh because i was i was coming from this perspective of audience interaction and on and bringing volunteers out and i know that's something that cirque plays with a lot so I, I was going to ask you if you did that at all in, in the Cirque show, but then it kind of was a broader question just about. Oh, like, yeah. Like... The first, I, I did three different productions uh, with them. Uh, one of them was Kidam. And on that one, I was I was actually performing someone, uh, David Shiner's material. So that was a piece where right. in a very structured thing with the cinema act and, this, and the thing we were going yeah. on a date. Uh, so, um, yeah. Well, that that was, like doing somebody else's material. It was, it was fine you know it's it's very good material it, it worked well it was a good match for me uh like i think that he and i have uh there's a thread of attitude as performers that that links us together you know there's something sometimes that could be wild that can be could play with it the uh sometimes aggressive sometimes sweet uh, energy so like that was a very good match and it was a beautiful structure to play with him totally lots of fun mm. um iris um the, you know it was i had there was less of me in that show improvising there's a little bit of, i get it i got to do in this award ceremony number that we had all made uh where i got to have like 
a competition uh, with an audience member. Like I had wanted, they'd won an, a, an Oscar, basically an award. And I was like, and they come uh, up and slap you. The, the, no, they don't come up. And, they didn't come up and slap me. No, no. But basically I went up in the, <laughs> oh boy, that's a whole thing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Then I basically, I was like, I felt jilted because I was an actress who did. Oh, cool. Yeah. Want, and so we had kind of a, you know, a thing to, to sort of like seduce the camera and, you know, a death scene. And um, so that was, that was pretty fun. And then in, in Alegria, I didn't really have like much, I was a character in that versus like the clowns got to do the, the interaction stuff with, uh, with the audience mm. member. That, so. mm, mm. Um, David, uh, there's some, there's some questions and comments here. Jen is back with a question. What are some of your techniques for creating content? I guess we've heard some of those, but yeah, what else? Um, well, I mean, sometimes it just depends on, on 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 which way. Like sometimes, like I might just I just I have different. I suppose I come at it from different angles. And so like sometimes I might just like have a sort of thematic territory, and I'll just begin to play with movement and sound, and then add text on top of that, and I might find a persona. And I could bring that into a space or work with an ensemble into that. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes I might have a particular way that I might want to. So in the way that I was just describing, maybe that's about showing something and embodying something in front of the audience, a more kind of oblique way of, mm. of, of mocking in a way. Like I just become things. Uh, yeah. Other times I might um, want to... How do I say this? Something it might be more confrontational. So I might mm. have something I want to explore with the audience and I might want to excavate information from them. So mm. I will um, maybe set a seed of a theme in some way through some sort of play uh, and then play around that theme a little bit and then begin to take that into the audience to figure out like where they sit in terms of, like what are the different roles that are in that theme that the audience uh, happens to fall into and I might mm. exchange or interplay with them. And as I'm getting information, maybe I might play with that information, become it, show it, or I might, you know, I might sometimes create a game where I'm, it's almost like, ritual in some way it's like this active participation and playing out of things mm. sometimes what i what i'll get into that stuff takes a lot of like thought and yeah. i don't necessarily do that improvised a whole lot in front of the audience if it gets into kind of hot spots then i've got i've thought that out in a rehearsal process and brought in sometimes people into that rehearsal process to figure out the ways into things or what things to avoid or whatever. Yeah. I was just going to ask you actually, if you do build people in that way, sort of uh, trying stuff out in front of people in rehearsal, it sounds like that is something you do. Yeah. That's been uh, super important to me uh, mm. to have uh, yeah. Rehearsals will bring in a few people and usually sometimes it, a lot of my stuff is kind of agenda stuff. Like I'm trying to take in the audience a certain place. I'm trying to find out, like, I just feel like, there's some part of me which is like I I always imagine that an audience is saying is saying I don't think they really are but that I imagine that they're saying what's it got to do with me, mm. you know and the, there's some sort of thing uh, that I'm interested in that or maybe I'm <laughs> I'm saying that <laughs> so like I just want to and it's part of that visceral thing I think it's part of that visceral thing like I want them to be like <gasps> that's me that's me. You know, or, and so sometimes I directly go and we'll bring up stuff in conversation about that. Um, so when I, if I am in a rehearsal space and I bring people in and I have an agenda or I'm trying to get to a certain place with people, then I might, I just wouldn't tell them what I said, we're going to do this thing. Thanks for coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll take it through. And sometimes I might get into these interviewing things, but I, you know, maybe I don't know quite how to get there, quite where I'm going. So I'll do this thing. And then I won't, I'll never start by saying, this is what I'm trying to do. Never, ever. I just want to see like, how's it go? What's the experience? Mm -hmm. Afterward, I, mm -hmm. And so I might go through the whole thing at once and I'll be like, I might not tell them then. I might say, I'm going to do this again. 
I still don't tell them what I'm trying, what I'm trying to do, what I'm, what I'm mm. looking for. Mm. You know, I, I might think about it and try it again. And then once I've like done that, then I'll say, okay, here's what I was trying to do. Mm. Uh, say, what was your experience? Or may I might even, I might even say like, what was your experience of that? And then like, here's what I was trying to do. Uh, I wanted, maybe I wanted you to have that experience. Did you have that experience? Or was, I was trying to get this kind of information. Uh, did you, you know, what were the things that were happening with you, the audience member? Mm. Uh, did that, what I was trying to have happen, happen? And if not, what could, what do you think that I might've done mm. that then would allow me to get to that space with you? That's super interesting. Um, so, it, um, and is it is it therefore important for you that there's a match between what people were sort of thinking or seeing or experiencing and what you had intended to bring? Well, you're not in control of that. Mm. You know, you're not in control of that. And in, in some ways, honestly, like, I think that that's something that I had done. It's not necessary at all in the space of Buffon. It's just something that I had developed, uh, which I think people found interesting because it was about them. Yeah, uh, but I will say that the more tied to an outcome I am, the weaker my position. Mm. So, like, whatever the audience says, I have to be like, okay. Like, the best thing is to be like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> play with that. That's fantastic. Because, like, I think that one of the things uh, Giovanni Fossetti was a. Uh, a great, great, he is a great, great teacher and, and, and as a, a teacher of mine. And he's always just kind of, and also Aitor Basari, when we were creating this last show, he was, Aitor was saying like, you never want the audience to be able to think for a moment. That's not true. Mm. That you have to keep truth in the room. Even if you want to talk about this truth, you have to address the truth. And Giovanni was always talking about like balancing the force in the room. So that in the one sense that there's a sense of confrontation I think that really Buffon and also Clown as well, they're balancers, right? There's a certain force which is not neutral anymore. So, mm. you know, the Buffon, it's the force that they're looking to in the audience or, or, in, or in the, you know, archetypes of the, of the world or something that they're looking to say, like, they're saying this, but really let's look at this thing that they're not looking at or, you know. Um. By the way, Giovanni is uh, doing a workshop in Portland in a, in April, yeah. um, which is aimed at teachers. It's a workshop for teachers of red nose clowning, and um, so you should come up and do it because I'm going to do it. I can't speak highly enough about Giovanni. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. Um, well, we we are pretty much out of time, folks. But I want to say something, which is that so I've started using this. Um, this thing which is for supporting artists called buy me a coffee right and so i'm just going to give this a whirl because i haven't tried this before i i think that you folks out there who've been have watching this for an hour might feel that it is worth a coffee right what you've just experienced particularly on the part of my amazing guest eric davis so i'm going to suggest coffee I'm going Absolutely. to suggest that you, if you're watching this, buy two coffees, one for Eric and one for me. That's, that's <laughs> very outrageous. I would, outrageous. Prefer, I would prefer a falafel or a pita. But, okay. but that would, that would each, either of those would cost maybe about $5, which is exactly uh, what a, a coffee costs when you buy it on this particular app. So I'm you owe it me a coffee. Out. Yeah. So any money that you donate on this link that I just put up, I'm going to split 50-50 with Mr. Eric Davis. In that case, I'm going to order the lobster bisque <laughs> because I think it's a little higher, higher price point. All right. So whatever a lobster bisque costs, that's how much you have to give for Eric. And um, a coffee is fine for me. Make yeah, it just a coffee. Don't, don't. Drip, not, drip, make drip, it, drip coffee. Not. Not Dunkins. Don't get Dunkins. Can I get like a, like syrup and a cappuccino and like a really like you know make it a good one, guys. I I, I have to say it's I want to say thank you 
for 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 doing this Barnaby. Uh, like it's been amazing to get to hear all of these um, other not myself, but like to, to see all of these other people speak uh, that you know of, but you don't get to necessarily run into in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, like, it was really cool just to get to meet Bob Berkey, who was like so influential to I know, right? To, yeah. To, that I had met and to hear him talk about things. Um, so I think it's fantastic. And for sure, uh, you deserve a coffee. Well, as I say, this is a new experiment, but I think uh, if, you know, I, I, I'm going to share my coffee with you, Eric. Whatever I get, whatever people donate coffee-wise, I'm going to give half of that to you. That's so and, sweet. Um, and I'm going to try that for the next few weeks. I'm, I'm talking with um, Robin Hambrook next week, who is a wonderful clown in the UK, and she's into uh, she does a lot of protest political activism. Cool. Clowning, Very cool. Which is very awesome. Um, and I need to have Larry Bogad on here. There's so many people I need to get on, Eric. And you, if you have any thoughts, who do you think I should, who would you love to see? Natalie Palomides. I don't know her. Sure. Okay. She's, she's fantastic. Um, she, uh, she is a clown and performer uh, who is currently living in Los Angeles. Um, she's going to, I think she's probably going to have some stuff on Netflix soon. Um, wow. She had a couple of shows. One was called Laid and the other um, uh, called Nate, but you can look up those. And um, she's a phenomenal, fantastic, uh, beautiful, very fun, uh, vibrant performer. Mm. Awesome. So, definitely. All right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to you all. Um, I will see some of you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for the final installment of Create Your Clown Masterpiece. And um, next week we'll be with Robin Hambrook. So thank you so much, Eric. It's been thank really you. a pleasure. Wonderful talking to you. My pleasure as well. Goodbye, everybody. Coffee. 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 I'm just going to hang on. I'm just going to give you a little outro here. Oh. It was kind of the end. <laughs> oh, all right. Here we go. Bye, everybody.